Church family, it is uh, so good to see you this morning, and uh, those of you who are here this morning and you're a guest with us, we just want to pause uh, and say thank you for being here. It means a lot that you would take time to join us on this Sunday morning, and, uh, and so if you ever have anything, any questions about us or the church or if there's anything that we can ever do for you, would you please uh, let us know? We'd love to connect with you. If you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, we miss you, miss seeing you in person, but we're thankful that you're able to join us uh, online. Uh, as we start our service off today, again, like we do every time, we just want to take a, a time to, to, to pause, and w we all bring into the room different things, different burdens, different things that we're carrying, and we just want to pause and just lay those things at the feet of Jesus uh, as, we, as we gather, as we, as we sing, and as we study, and all of those things, uh, but just committing this time and our own hearts before the Lord. So you just take a minute. Would you pray with me? We just go ahead and close your eyes. We're going to pray and just have a moment. Uh, to just commit this service to the Lord and our, our hearts as well. Well, Lord, we do thank you for the chance to gather this morning. We thank you for the privilege that it is to come into a room uh, with, with others, uh, to, to sing, to celebrate you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for um, just the chance that we have uh, to be together. Lord, I don't know all the different things that, we, that come into the room. I don't know the different burdens, the different struggles, the different trials, the different joys, the different celebrations that, uh, that are represented here, but you know them all, and you know them perfectly. And it's not an accident that we're here this morning. 
you have a specific word for us. You have a specific uh, uh, thing that you want to teach and show our, our hearts this morning. So I pray that as we open ourselves and our open up our lives for you, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, would you meet with us today? Would you be honored in the songs that we sing? Lord, as we, as we study your word, as we think through uh, the, the miracles and continue our study through the miracles of Jesus, would you meet with us, Lord? We commit this time, we commit this service to you and to your hands. In Jesus, it's in your great name we pray. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the eyes.
lift you high this morning because we acknowledge that you are the only true God. And Jesus, we are just so thankful that you came to this earth to die on a cross for our sins, to save us from that penalty of death. And we owe all we have to you, Jesus. I just pray that we would live fully surrendered to you, going wherever you ask us to go and doing whatever you would ask us to do in your name. And Lord, as we just prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning, I just pray that you would speak through Pastor Kevin and that we would be open to hearing your word this morning. And we love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. After Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, he spent time with his disciples over 40 days. During that time, Jesus told them even more about God's kingdom. Then Jesus told his disciples to go to a mountain in Galilee. They saw Jesus there and they worshiped him. Jesus gave his disciples important instructions. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus gave the disciples and everyone who follows him a job to do. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of people from every nation. Jesus also said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Then Jesus said, remember this, I am always with you until the very end of the age. Jesus told his disciples to wait in the city of Jerusalem until God kept his promise to give them the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said these things, he went up into heaven. The disciples watched Jesus until a cloud hid him from their sight. All of a sudden, two angels appeared. They were wearing white clothes. These angels asked, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come again. He will return in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Jesus left earth and returned to heaven, but he did not leave us alone. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to be with us and help us do God's work, to teach people everywhere about Jesus so they will trust in him as their Lord and Savior. One day, Jesus will return to make all things new and to rule as Lord over all. Kids can be dismissed and go on down to children's class. Uh, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 2 this morning. Mark chapter 2. And uh, we'll start reading in verse 23 here in a second. Uh, earlier this week, I put out on Facebook a question uh, to try to get some help with the sermon this morning. The question was, what are or what is the craziest things that you are, have heard or seen from religious legalists? Um, and I got some interesting answers. Um, I could probably write a book of those my, my own. Um, 
Maybe one day I will, but these are some of the answers that I got. Religious legalists. Um, someone who lives in Dominican Republic said, uh, I've heard that it's a sin to wear flip-flops to church in a country where the climate is extremely hot. <laughs> that, that would have had a, a real big problem in the first century uh, with sandals. Um, I had another friend, he said, uh, that he heard a pastor claim one time, any son that desires a haircut style that is different from his father's is in rebellion and is sinning. Uh, I don't know what happens when the dad is bald, but... Uh, another friend said, I heard a missionary when I was growing up one time, he preached against contemporary Christian music. And uh, one of the thrusts of his argument was that uh, first, it's a sin because it cons you, contemporary, contemporary, uh, and then it's only temporary. And that was, that's the basis of his argument. Uh, another friend said, uh, he said, when I was in college, I worked at uh, Taco Bell. He said, one, one Sunday we had a, warm, a lady came in, she had her hair piled up real high, and uh, after placing her order, she shamed him for working at Taco Bell on Sunday. Little did she realize the reason he was working at Taco Bell on Sunday is because customers like her were coming into Taco Bell on Sunday. Um, another friend gave me a whole list, and I agree with all of them, actually. Um, he mentioned uh, attending movie theaters uh, is sinful regardless of what movie. When I say I agree with these, I mean that they are examples of legalism, okay? I don't necessarily agree with them in philosophy. <laughs> Let me back, out, back up and point that out. Um, attending movie theaters is sinful regardless of, of the movie. Um, in, any English version of the Bible other than the KJV is the work of Satan. That's a real popular one growing up. Uh, only Baptists are going to heaven. Heard that one too. Uh, it's a sin to wear anything other than a shirt and tie or a dress and skirt to church. Um, all these are examples of legalism because they're not really found in Scripture at all. Uh, but one of the most egregious things I've ever heard, and probably one of the most outlandish and heretical things I've ever heard, is the, the claim that you can only be led to the Lord if someone is leading you in Scripture from a King James Bible. That's, that uh, rules out NIV or any other translation. Uh, these are some of the claims that are, that are actually out there. This morning, we're, uh, as we continue this, this series on Jesus' miracles... Uh, we're going to kind of look on, at uh, the conflict that's going on around this miracle rather than the miracle itself because this is one of these miracles uh, that is actually more for the crowd around than it was for the person actually receiving the benefit of the miracle. And, and we'll see that uh, in just a second. But extra-biblical man-made rules are nothing new. They've been around since Jesus... Jesus' day, and in fact, if, if we were to, to go all the way to, uh, back to the garden when the serpent tempted Eve, he, he added things um, to what God had, had revealed. Um, and so it really is an age-old issue that we face, and we call these man-made things, we call it legalism. Legalism, if I were going to, just a working definition this morning for us, is legalism is showcasing human effort to gain salvation or special favor with God or man. Legalism is showcasing human effort to gain salvation or special favor with God or man. Now, there are modern forms of uh, legalism or uh, Pharisee, Phariseeism. Um, one form in modern culture is, uh, that probably we would call it more secular, is what we call virtue signal, signaling, which is a favorite of modern progressives, uh, especially in the political climate. That is, virtue signaling is you don't necessarily care so much about the virtue, but you want to portray that. The real sin for the virtue signaler and progressive is, is not signaling the, the virtue, even though you might be hypocritical in principle and other areas reg even regarding that. Um, uh, Catholicism, 
was and is deeply corrupted with legalism. Uh, the teaching that, we, that you can receive grace through taking sacraments or participating in communion or baptism, and that's how you receive God's grace. Well, that's, that's not found in, in Scripture. And then, in the conservative Baptist movement, um, we kind of have our, our own issues. Um, and when it comes to legalism, and usually that will pertain not so much to salvation, but it might pertain to sanctification. Um, saying, you're, you are holy if you don't do this. So instead of relying on the Holy Spirit producing and developing fruit within us from the inside out, really the, the focus is from the outside in and presenting um, something uh, very special on the outside. All these are, are very scary things. Here, here in Mark chapter uh, in Mark chapter 1 through 3, Mark actually tells us about six different episodes where there is conflict between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees. Um, the fourth and fifth conflicts are what we're going to be looking at this morning, and they are about the Sabbath, or the, the particularly ways of observing the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath... Um, God worked it into creation. If you read the creation account in Genesis 1 through 3, um, on God created everything that we see in six days. Um, I believe that's six literal days. Um, and on the seventh day, he said that he rested. And we find out from other portions of Scripture that not, he didn't rest because he was tired, but that God was setting a precedent for humanity um, and that it is, it is good to take a, a, a break from physical labor and physical uh, work. And then later, God formally instituted the Sabbath into the Mosaic Law when uh, the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they were at, at Mount Sinai and God gave them the Mosaic Law. In fact, it's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy now. And when we're talking about the Sabbath, we're talking about the seventh day of the week, which would be... Uh, for us today, that would be Saturday. When we get to the New Testament, the Bible says we're not under the law anymore. Now, we may take those principles of Sabbath and rest and even setting aside a day that, that we treat as holy to God, but we do that in, in principle. We don't really observe Sabbath anymore because we're not under the Mosaic law in this age. Um, but the Pharisees, at this time, the Mosaic law was still in force, still in place, um, they had the problem of focusing on the letter of the law, but missing the heart and the intent behind why God gave it. And that's what we're talking about this morning. And in fact, later, Jesus would blast the, the religious leaders with this very comical picture uh, that there, there's a drink, and they're straining uh, and to see all the little things that are in it, and they're straining out a gnat, this little teeny tiny bug, but while doing that, they're ignoring the camel, <laughs> this whole giant mammal that is in the drink itself. So they led by this rigid legal observance rather than compassion. So in these two acts of conflicts in uh, Mark 2, 23 through uh, 27, and then 3, 1 through 6. In these two acts of conflicts, Jesus left us with some principles regarding how to keep the main things the main things. Jesus really boiled down the law and the prophets. It was love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and those were kind of the, the main things. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they got off track with that. So Jesus left some principles regarding how to keep our worship for God and how to keep our love and compassion for others at the forefront. And we'll see three of those principles this morning out of these two passages of Scripture. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Because these two different acts here are based on the Sabbath, I think they definitely certainly go together, and that's how we'll treat them this morning. Verse 23 it says, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Now, in our modern way of thinking, 
we see, oh, they're going uh, through fields on somebody else's property and they're just helping themselves to um, the, the fruit of someone else's labor. What is wrong with them? But this was actually perfectly legal and acceptable and um, expected in Jesus' day. In the Mosaic Law, in Deuteron Deuteronomy 23, verse 24 and 25, uh, it said, if, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, uh, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your, your neighbor's standing grain. So the idea was that this was put in place for the poor people, that they could access these things when there was a need, um, but they weren't allowed to, no one was allowed to harvest someone else's property like this. So what what the disciples doing here is perfectly cultural, culturally acceptable. It's, it's not a big deal. And in fact, this isn't what's going to get the ire of the, of the Pharisees. Verse 24. It says, And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, this word, it's, it's behold. It's, the, it's making an exclamation to, to point something out. Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the, of the presence, which, is, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. So the Pharisees, they, they're upset. And like, Your disciples are not doing um, what, uh, what is expected of them. Um, they're not fulfilling the Mosaic law. And Jesus points out to them, he asks them this question. He points them back to Scripture and he asks, uh, have you never read? This is probably a very uh, provocative statement that Jesus is using for these religious leaders who had, you know, these were the seminary graduates. These were uh, the, the top-notch uh, biblical scholars. And Jesus, have you never read? And then he goes on to uh, defend them from Scripture. And that's, that's really what's at the heart of, of, of the matter, because it is hard. We want to live holy lives, right? Um, we don't want to, to do, be a part of the pendulum swing, where we, you have one side, which is legalism, and then you swing in a, as a reaction to it all the way to the other side, which would be like antinomianism or or license, where everything is fine. God just loves everybody the way they are. He, he's happy with every way that I act. Well, that's not true e either, is it? Um, it's, it's, there, there's got to be a, a balance between uh, holiness and liberty. And so in, in that effort of, of, of finding that, we have to hold on to Scripture tightly. And Jesus points the Pharisees back to Scripture. Um, so the example he gives is when David was on the run from King Saul. David had already been anointed, um, but, but Saul was very jealous of him. David had, had killed Goliath. There were these, these folk songs going on around the country about how great David was. Saul had killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Um, and, and so Saul was, had become jealous. He had been oppressed by some kind of demonic spirit, and he was chasing after David continually to kill him. And so one of these cases, David has to leave town really quickly, and he stops uh, by the, uh, where the priests live, um, near the, where the tabernacle was set up at the time, and in stopping there, he, he, he needed some food. And so he asked the priest, Ahimelech, uh, this passage says in the days of Abiathar, Abiathar would be his son. Um, the, it's not an inaccuracy because these were the days of Abimelech, um, uh, of Abiathar. And David asked Ahimelech, do you have any food around here? And he's like, well, not really. The only thing we have is the, the, the bread that's set on the, uh, in, in the tabernacle. Now that was set... Uh, once a week, every Sabbath, this, these loaves of bread, I think it was like 12 loaves, they were switched out. They were probably represented the 12 tribes of Israel, but they were switched out every Sabbath, and it probably represented God's presence 
uh, within the tabernacle and God's presence in Israel. And so the only food that was available were these, these loaves of, of bread. Now, usually after they had sat for several days, they were changed out for fresh ones, and only the priests, uh, the Levites, were allowed to, to eat the, the old ones. But in this case, here is David, and this is a very important point, David had already been the anointed king. So in God's eyes, God has shown him favor, and it's only a matter of time before he's actually inaugurated as king. Um, but it was okay for David and his men to receive of this bread because of the, the need that they were in. So if it was okay, Jesus' point is if it was okay for the anointed earthly king to receive what was not lawful, um, how much more so for the, the anointed one? the Messiah to, to be able to uh, claim for himself food and an authority. So this morning, the main thing that I want you to get is beware of manufactured religious rules or manufactured religious um, rituals with uh, the, the emphasis on man. <laughs> that is, they are, they're man-made. And the only way that we, we can discern what is man-made and what is from God as God commands is familiarity with Scripture. Digging into the Bible ourselves and becoming, um, because we're all, to, to a certain extent, every single one of us is a theologian. Do you realize that? The question is, what kind of theologian are you? Um, because we all hold beliefs, but what are our beliefs based on? Um, the, mo- the, the valid, the most valid beliefs that can be held by anyone are those that align with what God has revealed in his perfect word, the Bible. So beware of manufactured religious rules. Continue reading in verse 27. And he said to them, so now Jesus has given this example, now he's going to make two very strong statements and application. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. All right, three principles that Jesus gives us this morning uh, regarding uh, manufactured religious rules. First, God's gracious gifts can be warped into man-made burdens. God's gracious gifts can be warped into man-made burdens. He says it right here. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That is, God, in, in creation week, what did God create first? What did he institute and order first in the creation? Humanity or the Sabbath? He made man first. And so man takes priority over the Sabbath. Now, of course, Sabbath was something that was given to Israel. It was a way of them identifying with God, identifying with the covenant that he had made with them and they with with him. Um, But the Sabbath was never meant to be a burden on them. Extra... uh, in this day, extra-biblical regulations had already been formalized in what was called the, the Mishnah in, in Hebrew. Pastor Jared mentioned some of these regulations and rules that they, they attached to the Sabbath. And what this was, was it was a commentary from the religious leaders of how you keep these laws in the Mosaic Covenant. Particular, there, particularly, there was one section that had to do with the Sabbath. Um, and there was like almost 40 of these rules that dealt with the Sabbath alone. Like you could only walk like 2,999 paces and not one pace more. However, if uh, in that journey, if there was food at that 2,999th uh, pace, you could start over because that was considered a home. Because you could only go 2,999 paces from a home. And so there were all these ways of working around this, and it was just kind of ridiculous because they were missing the whole point of, of why God gave them Sabbath. And there were regulations for, for work and, and very detailed regulations. Uh, R.C. Sproul summarized the attitude that was going on very well. He said, Jesus' point in saying the Sabbath was made for man 
was that it is a gift from God to his people. A gift to keep them from wearing out their bodies, their animals, their servants, and their fields. However, the rabbinic tradition had turned the Sabbath from a great gift to a laborious burden. People had to take great care not to overstep the boundaries the rabbis had set. So if, if there had been a tragedy in town and a, a house or a building fell on top of people, they were allowed on Sabbath, they were allowed to move enough rubble to see if there were any survivors. And if there were survivors, you could help them. But if people had died in that rubble, you weren't allowed to move their corpse until the next day, until the Sabbath was, was over. So remember, man was created before the first Sabbath even ever took place, and man takes priority. Sabbath was given as a blessing, not a burden. And so there's many things that God has given us that can also be warped. Um, from even this ritual itself today can be, can be warped. Um, but there's other gifts, really good things that are blessings that can be twisted and used as burdens on people or even weaponized in some cases. Uh, church it, itself, you know, if, if church becomes your identity or if it becomes your idol, uh, how some people that go into ministry, ministry itself can be an idol for, for some people. Uh, that's where they find their identity. And when that identity is taken away, they don't know what to do because they found them, their, their, their identity in a profession rather than in Christ. So church itself can, can become a, a burden, but it's meant to be this blessing. We have this fellowship of believers that are on the same walk and the same trail that we have, but when we attach certain things to it, like you've, you've got to um, align up with my expectations for you, it becomes a, it becomes a burden, doesn't it? And so uh, we could, in application, we could substitute this and say that, that the church was made for man and not man for the church. That is, people aren't just tools that we use to build up our, our kingdom here, a kingdom that with, with our names attached to it. We, no, people are more important than, than a mechanical structure. Other things that can be warped, music, obviously. It's this great gift that, that God gave us. It's, it's got beauty, and it's got artistic value, and it can be used in, in worship, but it can be uh, warped. And that my, my idea of, of poetic structure or whatever, uh, that's what everybody else has to uh, align with. That, that then becomes a burden. Our, our prayer the access, the very access that we have to God. Think about that. If you just think of that, having access to God. Jesus Christ is our advocate and mediator. We can, uh, with sin confessed, we can access to God. But if that becomes a, that can become a burden in our lives sometimes. And we think, oh, I've got to go through this rigid structure. If I don't uh, spend uh, the first uh, two hours of my day from 4.30 a.m. to 6.30. I don't wake up that early. But if I don't spend the first two hours of my day, uh, you know, on my knees and ag agonizing prayer, then no, that's, that's not the idea that God has, has for us. These things, they're, they're gifts. And the, the scripture itself, this, is, this is, really is, a, it's a love letter. And to take this and, and to make rigid uh, rules about this is, 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 is warping this great gift that God has given, given us. All right, so God's gracious gifts can be warped into man-made burdens. Secondly, the lawgiver takes precedence over the law. The lawgiver takes precedence over the law. Verse 28, here's Jesus' conclusion from this first episode. So, based on Scripture and based on this principle that derives from Scripture, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
Up to this point, Mark has recorded some other confrontations that happened between Jesus and the Pharisees. And in those confrontations, he is showing them what authority that, that, that he has. In that first instance we talked about a couple weeks ago, when Jesus healed or he cleansed the leper, Jesus showed his authority to, to cleanse. Uh, and then after that, you have the episode where uh, the paralytic or the, the four friends drop down the paralytic through the, the ceiling, and Jesus heals him. But what did he, he say? Your sins are forgiven you. That Jesus had the authority to not only heal, but to forgive sins. And here, Jesus is showing his authority over the Mosaic law itself and his authority over the Sabbath because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That means the Pharisees are not. But Jesus is saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. This is a claim to deity. He is equating himself with the Creator, and they realize this. And although the Pharisees had certainly misinterpreted the, uh, the Sabbath regulations, this instance here, this is not a matter of interpretation, but this is a matter of authority. And Jesus is showing that he has the authority over the Sabbath because he is the Sabbath giver. Listen, God wants our hearts more than our mechanical compliance. The lawgiver takes precedence over the law. So what that means is, in giving these great gifts like the Sabbath and, and other things, it's to help our walk with him, to know more about him and to love him more. That's why they're given. God doesn't give rules and commands just, to, uh, just to, to see how far he can stretch us into blind obedience. He does it for our good. And even in those cases where we don't completely understand everything, it, it, it still reveals our hearts and reveals to our own selves where we're at. Abraham, God gave, God gave a, a crazy command to Abraham. Oh yeah, your, your son that I promised that all these... Uh, nations would come from, take him and sacrifice him up on the mountain. Abraham went to, to do it because he believed that God would raise him from, from the dead. Of course, God stopped him from, from doing it, but in that test that, Abra that God performed on behalf of Abraham, it wasn't so God could, God's omniscient. He knows everything that's, that's ever going to happen. He knows every possibility that could happen. But what it, it, it revealed to Abraham, and it revealed to generations after him where Abraham's heart was, that he was justified by faith, belief. All right, so the lawgiver, this is a very important point, the lawgiver takes precedence over the law. They're not one and the same. Jesus does not have to, he's already showed that he's not breaking the Sabbath law, but Jesus, as the giver of of the Sabbath uh, and of the law does not have to submit to himself to that. He takes priority. He takes precedence over all of that because he is the law giver. All right, thirdly, this is where we actually look at the account of the miracle. Religious observances, religious observances are not substitutes for doing good for people. Religious observances are not substitutes for doing good for people. You realize when you come, when we come to church once a week and we do other things, you know, with church and as a church body, coming to church, that's not the serve, like actual serving. Yeah, we come and we corporately worship God, but just the observance of coming together, that's not the work in and of itself, right? You know, that's, that's not the end. Um, I, I went to church, so I'm a better person. No, the, the point is that we come and we corporately worship God and we have this accountability to one another and, um, and, and we, God develops us within this accountability to one another that we have. So Mark here, he records this fifth confrontation. This is, like I said, it's the second one that has to do with the Sabbath. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue. The synagogues were like these localized places of worship where people would come and gather on, uh, on the Sabbath. So 
because they couldn't go all the way to the temple. So at, at some point, um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, these synagogues were formed in different places. Now, we don't know where this case, uh, where this happened. It may have taken place in Capernaum because a lot of uh, Jesus' uh, works and uh, teaching and miracles did take place there early on in his ministry. We don't know. He says, and again, he entered the synagogue. Again, this was a regular practice for him. Uh, on this topic of, of legalism and everything, um, you know, some, sometimes we just, we need a break on Sundays. Like here in a couple months, I'm going to take a vacation. I won't be here during my vacation. Um, and sometimes we just need that break. But we should still be in a regular habit of corporate worship, shouldn't we? I mean, Jesus had nothing to really gain from being at the synagogue. What's he going to learn from, from the Torah being taught on, on Sunday? Nothing. He's, he's the giver of, of the word, but he was in a regular habit of corporate, corporate gathering, corporate worship. Again, I think that's a, that's a precedent for us. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. <clears throat> and they watched Jesus, the religious leaders, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. We're assuming Jesus might, is probably teaching. He might just be there, part of, of the crowd. Um, but they're not focused on what's going on at synagogue. They're obviously not focused on the needs of, of others uh, or what's even happening here as acts of worship to God. They're, they're uh, focusing on this, this rogue preacher that they've kind of already identified as this blasphemer uh, who is a threat to their religious rule. Now, when it comes to, um, like, medical and t attention and stuff in those days, if, if someone was, in, uh, was under threat of danger, like it was a, a life and death thing, people were able to help them on the Sabbath. Now, if someone had a, a, a headache or a bruise or had to walk with crutches, you couldn't do any, any of that on the Sabbath. You had to wait till the next day. If it was life and death, that was okay. But because what Jesus did here, um, what Jesus did here is there was this man, he had a withered hand, and this is not a life and death situation. At least um, when I say life and death exemptions, this was part of the, the Pharisees and the scribes' expectations of the Sabbath. This was not a a biblical revelation that, that God had given way back to, to Moses. But this is not, the guy has a withered hand. He's probably lived with this for a long time. This is not a matter of life and death. Um, in fact, when I, rem I remember when I played basketball in high school, there was this guy on a team that we played. Um, Jared played uh, for a different team around the same time I did, and he, pr he probably remembers him. But there was a, a guy at one of these Christian schools that had some kind of issue with his arm or hand, and, and you could tell it was much smaller than the other. I didn't know what the issue was, but he didn't have use of that other arm. But he played basketball, and it's, it was kind of embarrassing. I mean, he could dribble circles around me, and I could not defend him. Um, that says as much about me as it does him. Um, but, you know, he, he could still function. He could still do something that wasn't even a necessity, something that he could enjoy. And, and this man with the withered hand, this is not a life and, and death thing. The man apparently did not ask Jesus to heal him. He didn't initiate this, this miracle. This is something that Jesus did in and of, him, of himself. James Edwards, one of the commentators that I really like on, on, on Mark, he said this. And this is really good. The test of all theology and morality is either passed or failed by one's response to the weakest and most defenseless members of society. The test of all theology and morality is either passed or failed by one's response to the weakest and most defenseless members of society. And Jesus has compassion on this guy, even though the miracle is going to be for uh, largely for the benefit of others around him. Jesus still has compassion on this, this one man. Verse 3. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, 
Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? They were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. So when Jesus here, he says, like, is it right to save life or to, to kill? Or is it right to, um, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? In this case, Jesus saw it was either one or the other. Inaction here would have been contributing to, to evil in this case. And he goes on to say, to save life or to kill. There is a principle here. If, if we're not willing to do good, when the opportunity arises, we may be contributing to evil. When the opportunity arises and we do nothing, we may be contributing to evil. And Jesus goes on, is it lawful on the Sabbath to save life or to kill? I think what Jesus is doing here, he knows what's in the minds and the hearts of these Pharisees. Um, I think what Jesus is doing is that he's revealing that all this here is a setup. That here is this, this man that's in the middle of the crowd, and they, they probably propped him there so it would be obvious to the rest that he's, he's got an issue. And so when Jesus says to save life or to kill, here, here's what's going on. Jesus is there to save life, to give life. But the Pharisees, they are, they're plotting. How, how can we set Jesus up? How can we uh, get rid of, of this man? And of course, Jesus knows what's, what's going on. And so after he asked this question, it says that they were, they were silent. That is, they, they knew the right answer, but they weren't willing to admit the truth. And I think when Jesus, when this happened, it says he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Uh, you could probably hear a pin drop at this moment. Everybody's looking around. Tension is, is thick. And what's going to happen? And in the midst of that, it says that, that Jesus is both angry and grieved at the same time. What is he angry at? He's, he's angry at the, the hard-heartedness of these religious leaders who are, who are the ones that are supposed to be leading and setting the precedent and an example for the rest of Israel. He's angry at them. Not only is he angry at their hard-heartedness, but he's also grieved about their hard-heartedness. So, meanwhile, the, while the, the man, his, he has a withered hand that is, is dried up or it's stiff, it's cramped up, and there's no, no moving or anything with it, he has this dry and stiff hand, but it's the, the Pharisees that have the hard hearts. And sometimes it's easier, in this case, uh, Jesus healed the hand where the hearts wouldn't be healed, would not allow themselves to be healed. This is a strong statement. Legalism, listen, legalism is a damning lifestyle and belief. We can, we can joke about it. We can um, be comical about how far people go and find the humor in that. And I'm not saying that's not okay. But in and of itself, legalism is a damning lifestyle and doctrine. Look at the hard-heartedness. Legalism reveals a hard heart and it promotes self-righteousness. And in this case, this miracle, Jesus doesn't even, he doesn't, there's no mention of him praying, there's no mention of him touching the man, he just gives him a command, stretch out your arm. He stretches out his, his arm, his hand, and it says it was restored immediately. Verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him 
how to destroy him. The Herodians were more like political. If, if the, um, the Pharisees were religious activists, the Herodians were political activists. They were supporters of Herod and Roman, Roman rule. The two did not get along. But in this case, they were willing to partner together to, to find out how they could get rid of, of Jesus. And the irony and the hypocrisy here is, is so obvious that here they are, they're criticizing every little thing about Jesus and his disciples in these two events. You're, you're taking grain and, you know, uh, twisting it in your hands so you can eat it. Uh, you're healing a man in the synagogue on, on the Sabbath. They're nitpicky about those things, but here they are in their hard hearts. They are plotting how to kill the Messiah on the Sabbath day. They're plotting how to kill God's holy man on God's holy day. And Jesus has pointed out in this event that any time is right to do good. Any time is right to do good. But as we do good, anybody, can, anybody is capable of doing good. We are depraved beings. We've all inherited sin. And because of that, we need someone to reconcile us to God. Jesus came. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead three days later in order to reconcile us to God. All we have to do, do is put our faith and trust in what Jesus did on our behalf. But even in that fallen nature, people are capable of doing good. Now, don't get me wrong, not enough good to earn merit with God, but even the worst of people can do good things. I'm sure Hitler was nice to someone, <laughs> okay? Um, but we do good as believers. We do good as an act of worship, not an act of penance. So doing good for us, it's an act of worship to God. And listen, sometimes worship and law will clash. When worship and law clash, worship always takes precedence over legal obligation. Whether it's religious or whether it's civil. Worship always, worship of the one true God in the form of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That takes precedence over legal obligation. So worship regulations, like it did for the Pharisees, worship regulations must, or traditions, must not, must never inhibit our worship. When they start, when traditions, they can be good, they can be bad, but when they start to inhibit our worship of God, they've taken a bad place in our lives. For our, our, our church. In Luke 18, you can't talk about legalism without at least referencing these two particular passages of Scripture that I want to close with. Luke 18. Jesus gave this parable. He says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. A tax collector, let's just be honest, probably had about the same reputation as they do today. Um, tax collectors were very looked down upon in Israel because they were, they were Jews that had betrayed other Jews in order to collect taxes for the Romans, and then they would take a big piece off the top for themselves. And so they were looked down upon. But there were two guys that went up this renowned religious leader in Israel, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. It says that the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But look at the contrast here. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
the really disturbing part of, of this parable for me is, is that I see myself still in this passage of Scripture. And in many cases, I'm still that Pharisee instead of the tax collector. Where do you see yourself in that parable? Matthew 23. If, if you want to read a scathing rebuke of Jesus towards the Pharisees, it's in this chapter. Go home and read chapter 23. Matthew 23 and verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. That is, they have the authority of, of, te of formal teachers in Israel. And Jesus said, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. And here's the worst thing. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move, move them with their finger. So here are the religious leaders. They're, they're ready to pile all this baggage and extra biblical stuff on top of people. But they're not willing to help with the burden themselves. We cannot, we do not have the right, we do not have the privilege of atta attaching personal preferences or cultural norms to the gospel. When we do that, it's not the gospel anymore. It has huge portions of the gospel, but it's not the gospel anymore. It is, it's, it's our teaching and not God's. Legalism says... Look at me. Look at me. But true discipleship, true discipleship says, look at Jesus. Legalism says, look what I can do on my own behalf, putting myself in the spotlight. But true discipleship says, look at what Jesus can do for you. True discipleship says, this is who we are. We're sinners in need of a savior, but Jesus died on our behalf. And he uh, rose again on the third day. And that moment that we believe, our standing before God completely changes from child of the devil to child of God. And that can happen for you this morning in an instant. In an instant. God, God saved Paul from this lifestyle. You know, Paul was a Pharisee. He was part of that crowd. Um, he, he had put his stock in his heritage, in his family tree, and God saved him out of that. Yeah, I, I grew up in a, a blessed, blessed country, in a blessed town, in a blessed family, and so I know the difference between right and wrong, and, and so God's just going to let me into heaven because I know the difference between right and wrong. But the problem is that sin that we're born with is terrible and can only be fixed by Jesus. So, in summary, legalism says, look at me. Discipleship says, look at Jesus. Right? We you bow your heads and close your eyes? This part of our worship this morning is finished. Um, and now we're going to transition into a time where we just want to ask you, if, if God's working on your heart, here's a chance to respond. You can, you can pray right where you're sitting um, and talk to God. Maybe you've never talked to God before. Maybe you tried and you don't feel like you ever got a response. Maybe you, you felt like your prayer just bouncing off the ceiling. Um, but where you're sitting at this morning, you can embrace what we've talked about, the good news that what Jesus does and did on our behalf. And where you're at this morning, you can make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. 
There's no, nothing better that you can do in this life. And there's nothing more necessary for you to do in this life but to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. So where you're sitting, it's, it's really simple. There's no exact words that you have to say. You just acknowledge to him in some, some way, communicate to him, God, I'm, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I admit it. I'm as bad as the word, your word says that I am. And I acknowledge that my only hope is Jesus Christ. And I want to embrace him, God. I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. Save me today, Lord. I believe that Jesus died and rose again on my behalf. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning, you can do that right there. If you need to talk with somebody, if you have some things going on in your life and you just need some counsel, you need somebody that will, will pray with you and love you, um, we invite you this morning as, as we start singing. You can come forward. You can kneel at this altar. You can grab me. You can grab Pastor Jared or a host of other people that are around you this morning and say, hey, I need some prayer. I need somebody to talk to. We invite you to do that this morning. We're not pressuring you to do anything, but this is an opportunity that God can give you liberty like you've never known before. So would you stand to your feet? Everyone stand into your feet. I'll be right down here. If you need somebody to pray with you, if you need someone to talk with you, uh, we're, we're here for you. Um, and we want to pray with you. We want to walk with you. Um, and just do business with the Lord as is necessary for you this morning, okay?
as our prayer this morning, we say thank you. Thank you for your blood that washes away our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking the punishment and the penalty for our sin, placing it on yourself and paying for it in full on the cross. And so this morning, we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you for your word. Help us to walk in it and walk in liberty and in freedom. Lord, that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Church, would you just be seated for just a minute and um, have a couple quick things that we want to share with you this morning as we before we go out of here. Um, one is just by way of announcement, and that is that next Sunday, uh, we are going to have our Explore Hope Valley class. And so we've had several new families and several new people that have been hanging out with us, and we love it, and we want you to be able to uh, have a moment where you can ask questions where you can learn more about sort of the heartbeat of Hope Valley Church, and that's a perfect opportunity to do it next week. Uh, We will be right after the service. I say right after, not exactly directly after, but uh, once we get things uh, uh, packed up and and, uh, and closed out here, then we'll go back there into the fellowship hall, and there'll be a lunch provided. Um, But it would be helpful to us if we knew that you were coming. So uh, if you plan on being there at the Hope Valley class next week, Um, Would you, maybe before you leave today, just let us know. You don't have to, no formal RSVP, just say, hey, we're going to be there. And uh, that way we can have a head count so we know how much food to have. Um, And then also have a, uh, just sort of a, uh, we have a, uh, uh, I say a manual, we have a a guidebook to walk through um, to show you our sort of core values, core beliefs, uh, where we stand on things, and uh, the mission that God has uh, given us here at Hope Valley. So that's next week, exciting. Uh, Hopefully you'll come and join us and stay for that. Uh, next Sunday after church. Uh, the other thing is, again, our hope, our hope communities that we have throughout the week, they are a lot of fun, and if you've never gotten connected in one, please see one of us, and we would love to, to connect you to one of our home groups, uh, a lot of which are meeting right here right now in the church building in the back, um, and then we look to, uh, it in the, in the days ahead, be going back into our living rooms. Those are hope communities. Uh, don't also, don't also don't forget that we have our student ministries that meets here tonight at 6 p.m., um, they have a great time each week, and uh, if you have someone that you know that would, that would uh, like to do that, that's here tonight at 6. They have a great time studying the Word together, playing, hanging out, and uh, have a great time. Now, with those announcements, um, I want to kind of transition for a second. Um, Caleb and Ann, would you guys come on up? And Doyle's, you guys come on up for a second. Um, we are, oh, you're, one Doyle's already up here. Um, so... If you guys have never heard of Compassion International, Compassion International is a, a, ch- a ministry that sponsors children around the world. And you, but most likely you've at least uh, come in contact with them in some ways. There's lots of good ministries like theirs. There's some of you, in fact, several in our church already sponsor kids through, through Compassion International. Some in our church sponsor kids through new li- uh, a new missions in Haiti, uh, also another great ministry. Um, some people sponsor, uh, um, in our family, we have um, some, a partnership in, in Uganda where two of my nieces actually started out as sponsor kids, and now they were adopted, and they live here in the States. Uh, so it's, it's very near and dear to our heart uh, to sponsor children uh, because we know that God has a heart for kids all around the world. And, and so um, I want you to watch this video, and then I'm going to have them just share a minute of their experience sponsoring kids. And then after that, they'll explain to you, in the back, we have a Compassion International table uh, where there's kids that are ready to be adopted right now. Like you could actually take somebody home and you could sponsor them uh, and you could uh, just, but we wanna give you a snapshot of what that looks like if you've never been exposed to it, you've never seen that. Um, and then I'm gonna let them uh, share just their experience for a moment. So let's, let's watch this for a minute. God wants us to help other kids so we can make a difference so that people in other countries have exactly all that we, they need. This is our story of sponsoring a child with compassion. So let's start off with compassion. Compassion is a thing that helps other kids develop and get what they need and stuff. And the Bible is pretty clear that generosity is not about how much you have, it's about what you do with what you have. I remember our pastor at our church sharing about how if you don't have to walk to work every day 
and you have a car, like you are like one of the wealthiest people in the world. That perspective made me realize how much I really have. And I realized that it was really important that we start being generous. You know, we wanted to sponsor a child, and so we looked with Evie and picked out a, a child whose birthday was, was kind of close to hers, so they were around the same age, and, and it was a girl also, and her name is Marabella, and she's from the Philippines. Um, Marabella is six. She likes singing. She also likes drawing, I think. Understanding the concept of poverty isn't personal until you put a face to it and compassion put a face to poverty and a child's name to poverty. And um, it became this huge concept that's just out there somewhere and gave us an actual person to impact. So they, so Maribel's year was like they had hurricanes. Hurricanes over there, typhoons over there. It made me want to help them because when I think about things that I didn't really like or times where it was hard. I think about poverty and how hard poverty would be. And I, and I thought, I wonder how these people feel. I was in the kitchen and Evie woke up and came in the kitchen and she, she literally walked out of her bedroom with this idea pretty much fully formed to the degree that she shared with me, Dad, I had this idea that um, I, could, I could draw pictures, me and my friends could draw pictures and then people could buy the pictures for a dollar and then we could send that money to people who are poor. I hoped that it would make a difference, that I'd make enough art to raise $500. You know, she came out of her bedroom thinking about someone else, which is huge for a child to do, and then thinking, what do I have? What, what ability, what assets do I have that I can use to make a difference? So, you know, we thought that getting involved with Compassion, sponsoring a child, we were going to be making a difference. And what we found is that through, through that, Compassion has given us um, a story and this purpose. Well, God wants us to do our gifts because He wants to make the world a better place and a better place for other people. Um, we don't consider ourselves as having very much, but um, because we had this uh, priority both of, of the type of family we wanted to be, the type of people we wanted to be as followers of Jesus, as parents. Um, Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. And so um, you have to move your treasure around to put your heart in the right place. As people are thinking about whether to sponsor a child, I want to tell everybody, like, do it. Like, it's gonna change your life. Like, you need to do it. So the blue is the sad kid because he doesn't have enough of what he needs. They need food, water, and medical service, and shelter. And the yellow is the happy kid because he has enough of what he needs, and he's been sponsored. We can all show kids the love of Jesus, sponsor a child, and make a difference. All right, let me introduce you just real quick. Um, so we have Caleb and Anna, and we have Dan and Audra, and they are both, uh, their families are relatively new members in our church, and just one, we, we're thankful for you guys, we love you guys, and want to hear uh, what God's placed on your heart. All right, uh, good morning. Again, my name's Caleb. Uh, I started in Compassion about eight years ago as a young man who... Um, just had his first full-time job. Was getting out and looking to closer. Okay, is that better? <laughs> Again, as a young man who uh, has his first full-time job, was looking to tie a face a little bit more to my tithe, to my giving, and in my way of helping. I love giving through the church, but it just wasn't quite um, as personal as I wanted it to be. And I walked into a Compassion Sunday event, and they started telling me about these little children and. Um, it's just something that, you know, start pulling at my heart. And so I was able to walk out and uh, pick out this little boy on the table, Samuel, uh, from Bolivia. He was six years old, and it just, his little face just broke my heart right then and there. And uh, I was able to take him home, adopt him. And then now for the past eight years, I've been able to watch him grow, to send him birthday presents and Christmas presents and um, you know, write letters and get to know him and, and what he loves and what and how his personality has grown. Um, 
along the way as well, I was able to pick up two other little, uh, a little girl and a little boy who are twins um, from Ghana, I believe. And, uh, you know, and, and again, through that same process of watching them grow and, um, and prosper, it's been such a cool, close, personal uh, type deal for me, just again, because um, of the exchange of letters, um, the exchange of gifts, and um, just, just the many things that, that this does and, you know, and the way it affects my heart as well. Good morning, my name is Audra, this is my husband Dan. Um, so we have had an awesome privilege to sponsor um, four kids through Compassion, and I'm excited to share that with you. Um, there was a time in my young adult life um, when I was not walking with the Lord, um, and um, through a series of God's perfectly timed and orchestrated events, and because of many prayers, God brought me back to himself, and I praise God for that. And in response to his mercy and grace in my life, I felt a strong desire to give to his kingdom work. And my sister Courtney, who's visiting us today, just happens to be here today, um, had told me about compassion, and I was excited to be a part of it. At the time, I was teaching kindergarten um, at an inner city school in Portsmouth, Virginia, and through that, God had really given me a heart for kids in need. Um, and so uh, I eagerly chose to sponsor a little girl named Annie Motto and a little boy named Abdul. Uh, they both live in Burkina Faso, um, Africa. I was sent um, information on their daily lives, uh, their, what their country's like, what their center is like. It's um, usually a, a local church. And um, I learned how just $38 a month um, would greatly impact their lives by meeting their needs, um, their food, clothes, medicine, their education and my favorite part is that they would teach them about Jesus and how much he loves them compassion is a Christ-centered church-based and child-focused ministry so we began to write each other and I learned about their interests how they celebrate their holidays um, more about their family and schooling and in their letters they always include a drawing and uh, they love to draw flowers and um, and then we exchange Bible verses. They'll tell us their favorite Bible verses or uh, words of encouragement. It's even encouraging to me as I try to encourage them, they encourage me. And Compassion provides a translator so that you, that's possible. Um, and you can even write letters online now, which is cool. And then a year later, Dan and I got married and together we decided to sponsor another little boy named Steven, who's from Ghana. And then years down the road, after all four of our kids were born, um, the military moved us to Florida for um, a six-month period. And while we were there, they had a compassion experience set up. It's a temporary um, large tent, and they provide each visitor with headphones. And um, they teach you about a true story of a child in a developing country who's living in extreme poverty. And as you walk through, you, you see their culture, and you learn of their, their hardships and their needs and their desperation. But then you, you get to see the hope that they were giving through um, having a, a compassion sponsor and how it impacted and transformed their life. Um, so the compassion experience was very eye-opening and it really helps to change your view of poverty and it moves you to, to be the change for a child in need. So we were moved as a family and we decided to sponsor another little girl named Ruth and her nickname is Koi Koi, which we thought was cute. <laughs> she also lives in Burkina Faso and we intentionally chose to sponsor kids um, trying to get kids in Burkina Faso and Ghana is nearby. Um, we were hoping to someday be able to visit them. Um, so far that hasn't happened yet, but Compassion is awesome because they'll, they'll help you if, that, if that's something you desire to do, they'll help you do that and um, help you uh, get that trip. So um, the role we play is small, but it can change the story of a child's life forever. Releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name is Compassion's mission. It impacts eternity for his glory. It is a mission that we are thankful to be a part of. And today, you have an opportunity to be a part of it too. You can choose to change a child's life through your love, prayers, letters, and financial support. In Psalm 82, three, it says, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. So if you could please be in prayer for these kids, 
and his awesome ministry and consider becoming a sponsor for one of these precious souls. It, it will be a blessing to you. So. Guys, thank y'all so much. And, um, and this is a, a really cool opportunity. You guys know that at Hope Valley, um, we, we have a heart for, for the world. Uh, we really do because that's God's heart. Because God has a heart for every single nation, every tongue, and every tribe. And so we want to echo that heart as well. And, uh, and one way to do that is through Compassion International. So, yes, please be praying about that in the back. There's a table. Uh, these guys are going to be, in fact, y'all want to hit that way. Uh, that way they're, you're ready. Um, they'll be back there to receive you, answer any questions that you may have. Please be in prayer. Uh, whether, you, uh, whether you sponsor one of these kids today or not, or maybe you already sponsor through another organization, and that's incredible, and that's awesome, and we celebrate that. Um, either way, we want to have the same heart that God has, that heart of compassion that we've seen even today in the scriptures. And, and uh, so just be in prayer for these kids. Also, I, I would also just ask, be pl- continue to pray for uh, the kids that we have uh, in, in Burma, Myanmar. Uh, still haven't heard from them in the past couple weeks. And the situation there is not good. And so we're just praying for them and over Ling and Angela and their ministry and the orphans, the 30-some orphans that are there. Um, again, it's, uh, it's, just, it's breaking our heart, and so we're just praying for them. And uh, I'm going to pray now, and then we're going to go out of this place worshiping uh, the Lord together. Uh, church, we love you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, it means a lot. And um, let's, let's pray. King Jesus, we want to thank you for these sweet kids. The kids that are back there on the table, the pictures that we get to see, the faces that we get to see, they're not imaginary. They're real, and they have real lives in different countries around the world, and there's countless like them. So Lord, help us just be your hands and feet. You've given us opportunity. You've given us the resources to help. And so Lord, would you impress upon our hearts, the way in which we can do that. We pray for those that are uh, sponsored through other organizations and other ministries, and we pray for them as well. We pray for the kids right now and the families that are in, in Burma, Myanmar, that are struggling and the, the unrest that's, that's happening there, even as we speak. Lord, would you strengthen them? Would you build them up? Would you guard and protect and comfort them in this intense season? Lord, you are sovereign, you are in control, and so because you are, this morning we get to rest and trust in that control that you have, and we get to give it all to you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. If you'll stand with us. You call. 